Welcome, everyone. I'm Dr. Susan Brown, director of the Center for Better Bones in Syracuse, New York. And I'm really delighted to be able to say that I believe there is a new frontier in bone health. And that new frontier is not only an expanded program that really looks to naturally maximize bone health in every area that it pertains, but also a new frontier in how we can actually measure an individual's bone strength a new measurement of bone density and a new technology to measure bone fragility and thus get an idea of bone strength and likelihood of fracture. That new technology is called the REMS technology. It is a very novel technology from Europe that's radiation free, it's similar to an ultrasound. And tonight we have two experts, two US orthopedic surgeons who, who have become first uh, adopters of this new REMS technology. We have Andrew Bush from the Central Carolina Orthopedic Associates. I've known Andy Bush for some time, and I thank you very much, Andy, for joining us tonight. And I congratulate you on your on your work bringing this new technology. Anything new is always tricky to introduce, and you've done a great job with the science behind this. And also, Dr. Kimberly Zambito, another orthopedic surgeon who's currently at St. Luke's University Hospital. These two innovative doctors have joined together to create a team to offer this new testing, this new testing of bone strength as well as bone density to the American public. I'm delighted. I'm delighted they stepped up to do this because for four decades, I was at the first meetings in 1984 when they developed these bone density machines. I was at the meetings in Harvard and the researchers said, we're gonna be able to predict who's gonna fracture because now we can measure bone density. And then 40 years later, we now know that that system of measuring bone density by a dual photon radiology called DEXA, which is what is used today in bone density testing, that that is seriously flawed. And particularly it gives very unreliable reports on many groups of people like thin people, low weight people, short people, people with small bones, and Recent European and recent European research suggests that 90% of the bone density tests have some errors. Half of those errors are probably substantial. So having seen thousands of women terrorized by their bone density tests, I am delighted that we have an alternative. And actually, let me tell you all that the first few hundred people we've seen get these tests, many of them write back saying it's such a sigh of relief. I would see these clients and say, I don't think you're at high risk, but the bone density would come back significantly low. The doctors would say, you got to take drugs. One woman wrote today and said for 13 years, she was terrorized by the bone density test. She got the Echolite with Dr. Bush. She found out that she had fine bone health and there was very little risk of fracture. That was life-changing because she was already over 13 years starting to limit her activity, seeing herself as weak and fragile. Our campaign at the Center for Better Bones is to empower every woman to take charge of her bone health and actually knowing what's happening with your bone health. That's the first step. So welcome, Dr. Bush. Welcome, Dr. Zambito. And we would love it if you would tell us about this new testing, what the test involves, and how the report is, is understood. Because each of you who decide to get this REMS technology, you will be immediately given a report a very colorful report that details your bone density and also your fragility, which relates to fracture risk. So it's good to know a little bit how to interpret these tests before you actually get a test. You can see the potential of this new technology. So thank you again for joining us and let's see what we can all learn. Great. Thank you for having us, Dr. Brown. We really appreciate this opportunity. This technology is a game changer uh, for bone health. Uh, it not only gives information about ben bone mineral density, but also about bone quality. 60 to 80% of our bone strength is derived uh, from bone mineral density. So the other portion of that is the mi microarchitecture. And up until recent years, we really did not have the information with regard to the microarchitecture. People may talk about TBS and use TBS, but that is not always available on DEXA machines. It is a separate software package. Um, with the Echolite REMS, it all comes as one unit. Yes, there are differences in the software packages that can be um, acquired with uh, the Echolite REMS unit. 
Um, but standard, most of us are using the bone mineral density as well as the fragility score, which is the reflection of the microarchitecture. And that's what we really appreciate in our center. We really appreciate the fragility score. <laughs> yes, the, the fragility score has been shown to be a better predictor of fracture risk than bone mineral density via DEXA or bone mineral density via the REMS. And what's really important from the client's point of view is to remember that we're really talking about fracture risk. That's the important yes. endpoint of all this. It's not bone density, it's fracture risk. And to any degree that bone density relates to fracture risk, that's fine. But a fragility score, a well done fragility score would be much more helpful. Yes. And as you, as you champion, Dr. Brown, for years, is you have to take into account the entire person. It's not yeah. about one single test. It's about the entire person. It's about lifestyle factors that you can modify, factors that you cannot modify, and really optimizing health, um, as well as, you know, in the aging process, starting to address some issues such as balance and fall prevention. So um, hats off to you for really championing um, that that approach. Yeah, thanks a lot. But, so tell us about this new technology. That, let's see exactly what, what, it's, what it offers. Um, we can go over what a report entails, or if um, Dr. Bush wants to add to um, what the technology is about, we can go in that direction. So whichever way you want to go. Sure. Yeah, uh, Dr. Zambito has uh, some prepared slides, which I think are great, and I think that will help guide us. Um, I, I got involved a little bit after Dr. Zimbito. She actually was the first physician in the United States to do this. Um, I was interested in, in REMS and the Echolite Team USA at that time got me in contact with Dr. Zimbito. And that was one of the reasons after speaking with her, not only did I become a REMS user, but we started collaborating on projects because we just kind of like some of the things that Dr. Zimbito says, I also share my opinion of what Dr. Brown's doing that it's not just numbers, it's, it's looking at the person, but you also have to have good numbers and you get those good numbers from REMS. So, so we've been now collaborating, but I, I'm going to pass it back to, to Dr. Zambito for Kim to go ahead and go open up her slides, and we can probably use those as a template to uh, discuss the discuss the report. Good idea. Yes, a lot of times people are very intrigued by the colorful uh, report, um, but there are some tripping areas that that it's taken a while for us to understand how to explain it to patients and even other professionals, so that they can really appreciate the information that's gleaned from these reports. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So we're going to go ahead and review um, the REMS report, just a very basic overview uh, of what the report is. Um, the goal is to develop an understanding of the REMS report. And for those who don't know, REMS stands for Radio Frequency Echographic Multispectrometry. It's also referred to as the Echolite test. Echolite is the company that developed this technology. So the actual technology is REMS technology. Okay. Okay. So I'd like to start off with a basic overview um, on the report. Um, there are four pages that I think really matter. Not all of the um, software packages are available on every REMS device. For example, body composition can be found on both the, um, the lumbar spine and the femoral neck, but really the, the body percentage, uh, body fat percentage is only on the lumbar spine view. I have not included that in this because it, it doesn't really um, affect or isn't necessary for us when it comes to taking care of people for their bone health. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it has on your upper left-hand corner as you're viewing the slide is a summary page, which contains uh, the bone mineral density, and then the REMS fragility score. Um, the Below that is a matrix combining bone mineral density T-score and fragility score to determine a risk category, and we'll go over that in a little bit more detail. Um, there's also a table which of five-year fracture risk per 1,000 subjects, and we'll go over this in a little bit more detail, but one of the things that Dr. Bush and I really tried to drive home with patients is that we're used to looking at things in terms of percent, which is per 100. This is in per 1,000. So when people were initially looking at their fracture risk, um, they, they were concerned um, until we brought that detail to light for them. 
Um, and then at the bottom uh, right hand corner of the slide is the image capture 10 seconds into each scan interval. So page one, um, that is a nice summary page. It shows a graph on the left, age is on the X axis and BMD is on the Y axis. It's very similar to what you can see with some de um, DEXA reports. You can track changes over time and see where you fall um, in terms of, of your bone mineral density over time. Um, the tables right below that indicate the BMD in grams per centimeter squared, a T-score, a Z-score, and classification be, uh, based on your T-score, which means normal osteopenia or osteoporosis. And they're color-coded. So in this image, we see a lumbar spine, L1 through L4. Um, they're green, that's normal bone mineral density. The L4 is grayed out because we did not capture sufficient data during the scan. And the one thing with REMS technology is that if, if the um, data is such that it cannot, the AI cannot process the data, no report is generated. So we don't really get the same errors that we get in DEXA reports, which are very um, uh, technologist dependent, positioning dependent, um, various reasons there can be errors on DEXA. And then there's fracture risk assessment, which is at the bottom left hand of that particular page. And it looks at the, it gives you the REMS fragility score and then your five-year risk of fracture per 1000 subjects. Okay. Okay. And then on page two is the fragility score. This is the thing that um, we're all fascinated by. This is the this is the information, um, which is a reflection of the microarchitecture of the bone. Um, on the x-axis is age, and on the y-axis is your fragility score. It's a dimensional, dimensionless value from zero to 100, zero being normal bone quality, 100 being poor bone quality. Um, it is independent of the bone mineral density, and it's derived from a comparison of patient spectrum, the patient's um, values uh, to reference models obtained from patients who have fractured and those who have not fractured. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Can, can, I, can I make um, just some, a point into that fragility score? Just Absolutely. For me, for me when, I, um, when I, uh, uh, do my bone health and I assess a patient, I will speak about the first page and basically what Dr. Zambito mentioned as far as that being similar to DEXA, it's, I kind of refer to it as a DEXA page. It's a, it's a densitometry, it has a T-score, it has the basic information that everyone's used to seeing. And the two numbers that, that Dr. Zambito alluded to, what a fragility score and then the five-year fracture risk are the REM-specific numbers that we then talk about and I talk about in the second page. So for me, the second page actually is the page I spend most time on with, with patients because I feel that that's why they come to me. They can get densitometry if they have a well done DEXA. What they, what, why you get a REMS is for the second page for that uh, fragility score. And uh, as Dr. Zimbito had mentioned early on in today's talk, it's, it's a fracture risk actually. When you're looking at the fragility score, you're actually getting an assessment of what, what the fracture risk is for, for, for the individual. And uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time, and if I start getting too much, please. <laughs> and uh, please help me along, but um, to, to kind of explain the fragility score, I want to go into a little bit about the physics, um, where DEXA is a method of measuring bone density by how well the bone blocks x-ray beams, and you have two, two x-ray beams of different energies. Uh, a more dense bone will block those beams better. Now, the stronger beam will get through better. The, the, the weaker beam will be held up or will be attenuated. Weaker bone will not really slow the, the beams up and there'll be very little attenuation, but it's the difference in the attenuation between the beams, the attenuation differential, which is what DEXA is based on. That's the, that, that's the mathematical process of assessing that that gets compared to databases that generates the BMD values. And as Dr. Zimbito had alluded to, it is prone to error because you have to be positioned exactly correctly. You, you, your spine can't be curved. You can't have scoliosis, a whole bunch of factors come into play for that way of measuring bone density to be correct. Now, even if I may interject, even yeah. um, osteoarthritis can affect the, the DEXA reading on that. Yeah, osteoarthritis is, is, is dense, but it's not, it's not structural. 
So it's not protecting you in any way, but it's going to make your DEXA Correct. report look good. Correct. And so, so that's that's kind of some of the inherent problems with the physics of how DEXA is done. And 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 really, it's got to be a very well done test, and things have to be lined up right. Now, REMS also has to be done correctly, but there is the the physics behind REMS, which is ultrasound. It is a little more amenable. Um, it, it's a little more forgiving as far as uh, as how, how the information is collected. So with with the um, with REMS. It's uh, a sound wave is being pulsed into um, either the spine or into the hips. And then it's not transmission. The, the sound wave is not passing through the bone. It is, but that's not what's being collected. What's being collected is what hits the bone and then bounces back. So it's the echo. It's like yelling into a canyon and hearing your echo come back. And the echo will repeat what you say, but it's not going to sound like you. It's going to be modified by that canyon. So uh, we're not gonna be able to discern what modifies that sound. Our, our brains aren't capable of that. But if you're a bat, you could fly pitch black, <laughs> uh, making these ultrasonic sounds and not hit a wall, uh, uh, catch a moth, say hi to your friend who's flying next to you and avoid a snake because you can see with your ears. And that's what REMS is doing. So, so the sound wave is being put in. Um, the, uh, the developers of Aqualite needed to establish, well, where are we going to examine the bone? Because obviously you're not going to bounce the sound wave off the bone. It's going to penetrate some, and you're going to look for the echoes that are coming out of the bone. So the, the determination was at an 85% loss of power or equivalent of volume, where there's an 85% decrease in volume is the sound waves that get, that get evaluated. So those are the sound waves then are going to be assessed by the computer. And to go a little more detail, how that, you know, what the next steps are is, if um, when, when those sound waves come back at 15% original power, it's not just bone, it's intestine, it's muscle, it's fat, it's cartilage, it's bone spurs. Well, the first line of filtering is looking at the sound wave, your sound wave, and then a, a database of a sonographic profile of bone and making the comparison. Does this look like bone or is it something else? Well, this is bone, it goes in a cube. This is not bone, it gets thrown away. Not bone gets thrown away. And a queue gets filled up with sound waves that match this database. Yeah. If that if that queue is filled, then the machine goes on to the next step. And we saw on the first page what Dr. Zimita was showing that one bone was gray. Well, the queue for that mm -hmm. bone was not filled. Now there's standards why it was still acceptable, but that bone was not analyzed because the, the queue was not filled with enough information to be uh, statistically relevant. After um, now, when the queue gets filled, then the computer is going to analyze those sound waves, and it establishes a, 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 like a hologram of, of a, a trapezoid of bone at, at the 15% power loss. And I like to visualize that as almost like a loaf of bread coming out of the oven. So you have this loaf of bread sitting in the femoral neck or in the in the, in the bones, and then what do you, what do you do with a loaf of bread? You slice it up. So you look at every slice, and then you're examining the echo that's coming back from every slice. And one of the echoes was created by how many crystals you have. And that was the first page we looked at what Dr. Zimbito just went over as far as density. That sound wave is being analyzed and compared to a database of normal to osteoporosis, and then the BMD value is being assigned. The fragility score is completely different. It's a separate sound wave that was made uh, by how the crystals are, are, are configured, the structure, the microarchitecture, the collagen content, the collagen cross-linking. Those factors are, 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 are the strength or the structure, the strength of the bone. And that sound wave is coming out. And uh, the Italians were brilliant enough where they have the sound wave. And now what do you do with it? Well, you want to see if it, since it's structure, you want to see if it's strong or not. So what do you compare it to? Well, you can compare it to steel, but that makes no sense. Better compare it to bone. Well, what's strong bone? Well, bone that hasn't broken. What's weak, what's, what's weak bone? Well, bone that has broken. So you're comparing your sound wave to a database of people, uh, of bone and people uh, who have not sustained fragility fractures, and then to a database of people who have. And what does your bone match? So each slice is then allocated to either fragile bone, if it's closer matching bone that looks like somebody who's broken, it's called fragile, it'll go in, that, in the pile. The other pile of bone is bone that it matches somebody who has not. So the fragility score is actually a number of slices of bone uh, out of 100 that match bone than somebody who has broken. So the lower the number, the better. Now, the, the proportion of, of fragile to non-fragile then puts you on that graph and basically says that at what age, what is your risk of fracturing? 
And if you're in the green zone, you're basically with people who have not sustained fragility fractures. If you're in the red zone, well, you're in a group of people who have, so it means your bone is weak. In the yellow zone, there's a variation. If you're closer to green, your bone is still strong, but there are some people who have broken. If you're closer to red, there are people who, most people have broken, but some have not. So that, that kind of brilliance of that simplicity allows clinicians like Dr. Zimbito and myself to basically then talk to patients and say, hey, the structure of your bone, the, the sound wave that came out from your skeleton basically matches the sound waves in, in individuals who have not sustained fractures. Therefore, your, your bone is strong. And, and that allows me then to tell patients, I don't think you need medications. Or if the opposite is true, if someone comes out where they're in the high yellow or in the red zone, well, they're, they're, they're hanging out with their own crowd. And probably medication should be a discussion. Doesn't mean you do that, but it's going to be part of the discussion. So thank you for, for the, allowing me, Tim. Thanks for allowing me to interrupt. But that's, that's how I like to talk to my patients about that second page, because for me, that's the most important page on the REMS, on the REMS exam. No, that's a great, a beautiful explanation, Andy. I think you do a great job with that. Um, I, I will say most people come to us because they want to know how to compare their DEXA to their REMS. And, you know, they, they get focused on just that, that first page. And it takes a little bit of time to bring them around to, to help them understand about the quality of the bone and the fragility score and the quality and the fragility score matter. So that was a really beautiful explanation. That being said, you, you don't necessarily want to compare DEXA to REMS. They're two different technologies. Yes, there is correlation between the two technologies and we can go into that um, a separate time, but um, I, I really encourage patients, if you're gonna track things over time, you need to compare DEXA to DEXA and REMS to REMS. I see, um, yeah. yeah, and the fragility scores, you wanna track that now too, if, if you've had a REMS evaluation and and you're, um, you had the fragility score done. Um, I know this third page, Andy doesn't care for too much. <laughs> but well, you're working on it, you're, you're, you're making but it better. So I'm, I, I'm gonna get- I do, I'm, I'm gonna, gonna bring you it. around. Um, it, it's very similar to, um, what DTA Hans has done with the TBS score and that he's combined a matrix um, using bone mineral density as well as the TBS score. And for, for our instance, it's, it's the bone mineral density, the T score, and then the fragility score. So I do think there, there is something to do, um, something that we have to pay attention to is the BMD, but also combine that with the fragility score because I think it's gonna have an impact in the way we treat patients in the long term. Um, so at the top of this page is the matrix that combines REMS T-score and REMS fragility score to determine your risk class. So really it's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, you can find if your bones were green on the first page, sometimes you'll get a green and a yellow, um, but the overall color, wherever that you fall on the graph, if it's yellow, you go to the top of the, the matrix where the yellow is, which is osteopenia. And then if your fragility score was green, the little dot landed in the green, and then you you wherever they intersect is your risk category. And in this case, the risk category for this report is an R3, which is um, four to eight risk of a fracture per 1000 subjects over five years. So that that's something that's difficult for patients to wrap their minds around because we're so used to looking at percent. This is per 1000. And so the simplest way to look at it is just move that decimal point over to the left and really it's 0.4 to 0.8%. So it's less than 1% chance of a fracture. Um, do you explain that any, any other way, Andy? No, again, I, I usually don't go to this page, but uh, when I speak about the, the five-year fracture risk, I just, I, I tell folks now, because they're using BMD and BMD is out to the thousand. So it, scientifically, they kept it, reporting it as a thousand. But fortunately, and from a marketing standpoint, most of us are used to percent, like you're saying. So I tell them, tell them to divide that by 10. So whatever number is in that box, actually in the first page, I'll tell my patients to, to, to divide that number by 10. I usually tell them to skip this page. I, I know you do. <laughs> I'm going to bring you around. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you're going to make it better. You and you and uh, Dr. Kishiyeva are going to work on, are working on yes, this. So yes, I think you're going are. to make it better. Yes. 
Okay. And then the final page is, is really the image captured 10 seconds into each interval. Uh, for, for lumbar spine, there's going to be four images on that page for the hip or proximal femur or femoral neck, whatever you want to refer it to as. <laughs> it's going to have two pictures on it. And the latest software update, they eliminated the blue line. I, I'm not sure why. Um, I know a lot of times patients would focus on the blue line. And if the blue line wasn't there, they were worried that it was a poor scan. It's not necessarily the case. Um, and just note that there are various software packages for REMS. So not all will have the fragility score, the body composition. So if a patient is interested in getting a REMS evaluation, whoever they go to see, just make sure that fragility score is included um, with the um, the REM software at that particular location. And, and the you other one thing I want to point out, I, I want to just point one thing out with that last page, Kim. Um, what I tell my patients is I, I look at that with them to say, yes, this is a good test. And how do you tell that? You mm -hmm. want the uh, red line and whatever's captured, whether you have the, the um, scallop, the white line with the blue, or it's you just see a scallop of the vertebral body, you want it to be in the middle third of the screen. If it's either on the upper third or lower third, it's not optimizing the algorithm of the of the machine. In other words, you're probably making a mistake. Whereas if I you're in the middle you. third, yeah, you're, you're optimizing the algorithm. And that's and so that's actually the simplicity of REMS. As an examiner, we want to make our settings such that they're in the middle third of the page. And then if we do that, we know we're optimizing the ability of the AI of the REMS unit. Yeah, for us, it's a quality control, essentially. And let, let me just go back to what, what you said, Dr. Zambito. It's really important if, if, if our clients and individuals decide they're going to get a REMS, make sure that the place where you're going is capable of giving the fragility score. I've had clients go miles to get a test and come to find out they didn't have the software to do fragility. So always check into that. Make sure that the people who test you, the doctors are able to give you a fragility score. Yes, Absolutely. that's a great point. And in fact, I saw some of those clients ultimately. Yeah, they had to come down <laughs> to you afterwards. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I just wanted to, to really harp on the um, fragility score again, as, as Dr. Bush has as well. Um, for those people who are more inclined to look at research studies, not everybody's interested in, in digging in the into the research behind things, but um, Dr. Pisani, um, her latest um, uh, publication in 2023 really looked at the fragility score and determined that the fragility score was superior to DEXA BMD and REMS BMD um, when predicting um, fracture risk. Um, there was a cutoff value for the lumbar spine, which is about 37, uh, which showed a ninefold uh, increase uh, risk of fracture. And at the hip, the value, again, when we're looking at the fragility score uh, table, the hip value was 31.9, has a sixfold uh, higher risk. Um, so the, really the importance is, is really noting that the microarchitecture matters when it comes to our bone health. Is there anything you wanted to add to that, Andy? No, I agree, Kim, I, uh, I agree with you. Uh, Dr. Pisani has a couple of articles. A recent one from just this past January was a large study, as, as you have documented, there are 1,600 uh, patients who have finished the study. Our original paper in 2017 uh, laid out what fragility score is, um, how the database is developed, the this some of the, some in scientifically saying what I kind of said about a loaf of bread, she actually described that scientifically, and then had the initial uh, study, five year longitudinal study of, of individuals where she documented the fragility score was sensitive and specific in determining who fractured and who didn't fracture, and then this follow up study basically just reconfirmed that. So so right now it appears or my reading of these articles is the fragility score is the most powerful tool in determining fracture risk that's available clinically. Yes, agreed. Sorry about that. I always end my slide decks with a take home message for, for the listeners. Um, when it comes to imaging for bone health, there's pros and cons to each imaging modality. And really the imaging modalities that, that are in widespread clinical use are DEXA and REMS 
in Europe, and we're hoping to really bring it into widespread, widespread clinical use in the United States. Um, each of them has have pros and cons, and really for the REMS, I think the biggest con is accessibility. Um, but we're we're working on that, right, Dr. Bush? <laughs> and Dr. Um, Brown too. And Dr. Brown too. That's right. Um, so when you're when you come to get your REMS evaluation, just remember, try to compare DEXA to DEXA and REMS to REMS. We're all happy to go over um, each report with you and just kind of help you sort through what information is real, what information matters. How do I sort through all this information to make the best decision possible for me? Um, but I really want people to avoid the black hole of nitpicking every single number. Otherwise you're gonna drive yourself crazy um, nitpicking each number. And, and really recognize that, that you are an individual and what works for one person may or may not work for another person. And, and we as a group encourage you to learn and grow and engage in optimizing your health because there's nobody who will care about your health more than you do. Well, well, well said. Thank you. And that's it for the slide deck. I can stop sharing and we can have <clears throat> a little bit of a discussion if you'd like. Yes, you know, from a clinical point of view, like we have a very comprehensive program to maximize bone health, and uh, we see very few fractures amongst our clients, and, and we see generally improvements in bone density. Everyone knows, of course, it's a natural tendency to lose bone. The average person, the average woman will lose 45% of her bone and 45% of her muscle as she goes from 35 to 85. So age is an important factor there, but if we can slow down bone loss, halt bone loss, and keep that structure of the bone, the architecture, that's great. Is this technology, is a REM technology, does it, can you see changes over time? Can you see if a program is working, whether it be a natural program or a drug ther therapy program, have you, have we used it long enough in this country to see how that, how it corresponds with measuring the success of a program? Right. I, I think we can offer a unified uh, response on that one. It's sensitive enough to cha track changes in six month intervals, but I usually um, do it every year, every two years. Um, Andy's probably had a few a few more follow up patients um, than I have. Um, six months would be really very striking, even with the technology today, even two years, it's, it's very difficult to see really accurate changes. But so that's perfect. That's a, that's a hopeful thing that we could see changes over a shorter period of time. Yeah, there's, there's not, a, obviously in the United States yet, there's not a whole lot because Dr. Zambito has, has, was doing it for a while. She, she stepped away from it as she changed practices. I, my mind has picked up. So we were probably the two busiest in the United States right now. And now we are working with Dr. Nick Birch in England um, and Dr. Uh, Torgan, Tor Torganini, if I said his name correctly, down in Australia, <laughs> and we're going to probably be putting our, our data together. So those are things that we're going to look at. And I know, Dr. Brown, you're interested in a lot of those in a lot of those numbers, as we as we discussed in the past. Um, anecdotally, I have noticed that um, uh, individuals on hormone replacement and even uh, some of the anabolics like Forteo or Avinity, I've seen the fragility score stabilize. Mm -hmm. The the, the, the um, increase that had happened prior to the starting, or just in general, there was a, a horizontal sloping on the fragility score, which again, an anecdotal. I, I I don't have enough studies to say they're statistically significant. There's so many interesting things we're going to discover now that we have a possibility of looking at fragility, like. Uh, in, in older individuals, is there's a natural decline in fragility? Did the Italian researchers look at that at all uh, as far as what you'd expect, say, amongst an 85-year-old, what you'd expect for fragility or the, what they tend to see in average? I, I'm not familiar with any research. And I think as we get our data together and we get a larger set, I think probably Italy will be very interested in that, in, in, the, in the data we collect from North America and from, from England and Australia. Right, right. Um, and I, that's a conversation, again, I, we, we spoke, we, at one time, a few months ago, we spoke yeah. about that because I do see, uh, you know, I, I'm seeing more patients coming in who are over 70 and it's showing uh, uh, the REMS is documented degradation of, of bone, which is expected as you get older. 
I'm just wondering about the statistics that's that are being applied, like kind of like we discussed, where somebody who's who may be 75, who's healthy, has fallen down, is very active, hasn't broken, but Rems is saying, yeah, you sh you should probably break if you fall. Why is why is why are we seeing that? And and I'm seeing more of that as yeah. I'm seeing some older older individuals. Um, but but yeah. Andy, the yeah, I think that's really important. Excuse me for interrupting, but the okay. probably breaking is again something out of a thousand. So it might be what thirty out of a thousand or forty out of a thousand. I mean that it's 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 even if they're in the red. I mean it means that there's still just a certain percentage. It's not anything totally determined. And like you say, it would be very interesting to see the people that don't fracture as they get older and in that range where the qualities of the bone or the qualities of their life or the qualities of their program. Yeah. And, and you wonder about the, about the creation of the database. Where, who, who was the, the source of this database? Was, yeah. was it a group of healthy people or was it a population that might have been um, measured in, in a nursing home where the, where the population isn't as healthy? So, so that could and also, it, that should be looked at. Effective. Yeah, exactly. And it takes us back to Dom, Dr. Zambito's point that we shouldn't get carried away with comparing ourselves with others. We should look at our program, what we're doing. Are we doing everything possible? Like in, with my clients, am I doing every one of the six steps of the Better Bones program? And am I doing the supplements? Am I alkalizing? Am I doing the exercise? Clearly, strength training is a phenomenal way to build bone at any age. And so then to assess that and see how they can improve some of their behaviors and then see how that might be reflected in the REMS over a year or even six months. That, that's a very exciting possibility. You know, Dr. Brown, Dr. Zambito and I kind of, we see the bone health a lot alike and that's why we're collaborating. I mean, as we kind of hit it off that for that reason, we're, we're approaching it the same way. And the important part of it, I mean, REMS is a way of measuring. I mean, it's not, it's not making somebody's bone healthier. It's, it's a way of determining it, but we really believe in your program and what you're promoting uh, the, the healthy lifestyle, the, the, the correct way of, 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 of eating, of nutrition, and, and then really exercise. I mean, some of the newer literature that I've been coming across that I've, I've been promoting in my practice is the, the bone is no longer being looked at in isolation. It's the bone muscle units. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and if you don't have muscle, you don't have bone. So, yes. so really, and then you, if you've exercised, if you've, if you've been building your muscle up, well, if you don't have the nutrients, it's not going to happen. You're not going to either build your bone back or your muscle back. So that's the hand in glove of really what, um, what needs to be done. And again, what you've been promoting from, for, for decades now. And we now understand that there's everything is related to everything. And so certainly within the body, you know, we just did an interview with Acharya Sunya, one of these masters of Ayurvedic medicine. And she actually said that in the ancient texts of Ayurveda, which are 4,000 years old, they said bone is the strongest tissue in the body. Bone is not easily degraded. Nothing will touch bone. Nothing will make it severely weak except one thing, and that was negativity. 4,000 years ago, they said chronic negativity is very damaging to bone. And I see with my clients, stress and worry is very damaging to bone. I've seen it for decades, and it was interesting that that's, that's, what, they, that's what they say. And they also say Another word for health in the ancient sciences is happiness. And this breaks us back to Kim's point to find, to be settled in your own being, be, be satisfied with your path and kind of stick to it, study it, but don't get all freaked out by different things that are going on because it just throws you off your center happiness. And I really am proud of the work here because I, we do see, I see every day we're helping people be happier because they're discovering that they needn't be terrorized by osteoporosis they need to be terrorized that they're going to have to take these drugs. Some women may take the drugs. People, some women have very severe problems. There's many medical issues involved, but there has been a great deal of freedom and really a sigh of relief by every single person I sent to get a DEXA test. And, and I personally am very indebted to you, to professionals to step up and say, this is new. Uh, I'm going to step up and I'm going to look at it seriously from a scientific end as well as a clinical end and see if this would not be a better way to help women. And I certainly think it is, and, and I'm happy to be a part of the team because this is a game, game changing, like Dr. Zambito says. We're going to empower women, empower everyone to take charge of their, their health, starting with their bone health, and be able to measure the success and be able to remove the fear that's been, it's been 40 years of developing fear in women around osteoporosis. 
it's it's a very significant thing. Fear, we know now, fear damages bone. We have we have the, we have the biological mechanisms from Columbia University telling you how fear damages bone. So now we can help quiet down that fear and give people the freedom to build bone density. And if you're listening to if you're listening to us, take advantage, take charge. You know, look into the Better Bone Solution. Look into every step of the program because that is a perfect. If you have a bone health challenge. It's like a window of opportunity to say, you can use this window to build all of your health. And now that we have this new technique to assess bone strength, you can even more accurately know what's happening what's happening, and the degree to which the program you're working is successful. It's a new age and it's a lot of fun. Yeah. So we're going to be in St. Louis. If people don't know, we're going to St. Louis. Um, Dr. Zambito and Dr. Bush, have invited me to go along with them to measure uh, a number of people with REMS testing in St. Louis uh, this September uh, 25th, I think, to the 28th. Uh, and October. The REMS, the REMS technology. What did I say? I think you said September. It's October. We're doing oh, oh, October. October this year. <laughs> yeah, really. Maybe September next year. <laughs> we are going. We are. We're going to St. Louis in October of this very year, 2003. We're going to be there, measuring, uh, doing REM scanning, and we'll also be doing some lectures. Each of us are going to do some lectures to help the public understand. So be sure to join us. This is your opportunity to know exactly more about the strength of your bone. And it, with any any good fortune, actually, we already have other groups have asked us to join them in Boston and in Massachusetts. So stay tuned. If you can't come to visit with us in St. Louis, I'm sure there'll be another opportunity for you to catch up and get your REMS testing. Yes, I'm sure there will be opportunities. And you can always find out at betterbones.com and just keeping in touch with the work of Dr. Zambito and Dr. Bush. Well, thank you very much for for having us uh, over and, and 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 mentioning about the uh, our event in St. Louis. We're looking forward to it. Uh, Dr. Zambito and I have been planning it. And, uh, Mr. Johnny Harper, who has been who will be hosting it, um, we're looking forward to having a, a, a nice crowd and and uh, sharing a lot of information. Also, doing a lot of rams. Yeah, and that's really an interesting thing because the people that are interested um, are people like companies that are doing strength training that want to really see how much is my strength training improving the bone quality. And I look really forward to working with Johnny Harper and all the colleagues to see how we can assess what's happening with each individual, which program is very best for each individual. Yes, this is very exciting. I'm looking forward to this adventure in St. Louis. And thank you so much for hosting us today. It was my pleasure. And I, I look forward to seeing both Dr. Zambito and Dr. Bush in St. Louis, and maybe many of you will come along too. Have a great evening, and we'll be in touch soon. Mm -hmm.